The island of Savai in western Samoa is about as far from Britain as you can get. It's just one of the tiny Polynesian islands off the east coast of Australia. And in my search to find traditional survival skills around the world, I'm headed for the coastal village of Falialupe. The islands have been inhabited for about a thousand years. Settlers arrived here by boat, paddling huge distances across the Pacific to find new lands and a new life. It may look like paradise, but you can't live off the view. The Polynesians certainly didn't travel thousands of miles to set up shop here because of the scenery. It's a long swim between the islands, so to live here, you've got to be self-sufficient. And that means learning how to find food and build shelters in a land that's harsher than it looks. The seas are powerful with treacherous currents. Cyclones regularly sweep through these islands. The latest one flattened this concrete church in minutes. Which is partly why villages like Falia Lupo have hung on to their traditional skills, because they're effective. It's also because here, Samoan culture is still strong. The village is governed by a council of chiefs who ensure that their heritage, skills and close sense of community remain intact. They manage to use chainsaws and electric ovens alongside their old ways. This is the carver ceremony, held in a traditional house or fale, which welcomes each guest to the village. Ia Manuia. Farleys were designed to stand up to cyclones, torrential rain and sun. They are the most common sort of house in the village, built straight from the forest. We're going to need several different kinds of wood. This is the papaka, which is used for the major supports. For the rafters, we're going to need this, bow. And this is asso, for the ribs to hold the thatch. The traditional farle has rounded ends, so they've picked a piece of wood with a natural curve in it like this, and they're going to increase that by cutting it. Valia Lupo, about a quarter of the houses use corrugated iron for their roofing. But for most Fales, the Samoans turn to what they call the tree of life, the coconut palm. The leaves make just about anything in the village. Baskets, mats, plates, hats, beds and roofs. On a big project, you can see why the Samoans need their sense of community. On his own, one man would take weeks to build a good fale. Together, they can build a house in a day. They work fast, and trying to get them to slow down for the cameras was nigh on impossible. 
A layer of these woven coconut leaves will keep the sun off. But to keep the rain out, particularly in the wet season, you need two layers. And they've got a natural curve which helps to shed the rain. The ribs are being tied on with bark, and that comes from the fowl, which is the wood used for the rafters. This dead coral from the beach will be used to make the floor of the fale. That helps to keep the sand out of everything and makes for a hygienic home. The house is complete without blinds. And these ones keep the wind off as well as the sun. The fale is tailor-made for the islands and the climate. When the recent cyclone struck, traditional fale stood up better than most modern houses. The open sides allow the air pressure inside to equalise when a shockwave hits, whereas most closed structures just explode. It wasn't only the land that suffered. The last cyclone whipped up such huge waves that some coral reefs were totally flattened. Luckily, others did survive and play a vital part in this underwater world. It's only comparatively recently that the world has woken up to just how fragile coral ecosystems are. Some of the traditional Samoan practices are being abandoned and discouraged to give the reefs a chance to regenerate. However, as the women will tell you, good environmental practice doesn't always make for good fishing. In this big ocean, coral is a good hiding place for small, shy fish. So if you fill a basket with coral and camouflage it at one end of a small reef, you can use scare tactics at the other end to herd frightened fish into your basket. like an awful lot of destruction for a few small fish, but this technique's on its way out. There are, though, more selective ways. This is a type of harpoon that they use. Basically, it's an underwater catapult. Armed with one of these, Samoans start notching up fish that I can't even see in a matter of minutes. It was impressive, but then they said they were going to look for clams, lodged in the rocks six metres down. And they can go deeper, in just a pair of handmade goggles. The record that afternoon was 22 metres, and whatever the depth, they seem in no hurry, swimming about till they find something, a clam or a fish. I couldn't stay down there, but luckily, they can. In Samoan culture, every big project has an overseer whose job it is to watch and not join in, but advise where necessary. And now the guys are marking out the sides using the old carpenter's trick of a chalk or soot line. The canoe is light enough to pick up now, and the fine carving can be done at the beach. It amazes me how hard they're hitting the wood this close to completing the canoe. That's the confidence that comes with years of practice. They tap the wood to 
find out how thick it is and whether more needs shaving off. These are the coconut fibres that were soaked. Now they're ready for braiding up into a cord. First of all, you pull out a few of the fibres to form into a strand. One fibre is wrapped around the others so that it all holds together. And then you plait it together. I'm told some of the most productive sinnet weaving happens during the longer and more laborious village meetings. It's used to tie on the outrigger, which gives the narrow canoe stability. The Samoans prefer sinnet rope to nails because it gives with the force of the waves. This puts less strain on the canoe, so the outrigger is less likely to break up in heavy seas. It felt a bit precarious, but then this boat was a tree this morning. It needs to be dried out for a couple of weeks in the sun to lose the water in the wood. Then it'll float better. But still, it was astonishingly stable. It's a classic example of common sense ingenuity. Using one tree means there are no joints to leak, and a flexible outrigger keeps you upright so long as you lean slightly towards it. It means Samoans can travel out into the open sea to catch big fish and set traps nearer the coast for smaller but more leggy prey. This rock is going to be decorated to make a lure for an octopus. There's a legend hereabouts about an octopus that once gave a rat a lift across water. Well, that rat left a bit of a calling card on the octopus's head and since then, octopuses have hated all rats. When an octopus sees this, he gets really angry, grabs it and won't let go. It may not look like much, just a rock, a few leaves and some string, coupled with some patience, but that's all you need to get one of these. This trap works on a much simpler principle. Eels love dark spaces, and when there's food inside, the combination is irresistible. It's easy for an eel to slip in through this cloth tunnel, but it can't get back out. Setting traps near the reef is dangerous. There's every chance of being swept away by tremendous currents that rip through the reef. Once they've got the box to stay down, it's disguised with rocks, rather like the women's coral basket, and left for the eel to find. It's simple, but it works. To get to big fish out in the open sea, you've got to get past the coral reef that sits like a maze beneath the waves. At high tide, you float above it, but at low tide, the sharp coral lurks just below the water and can wreck the strongest boat. But the Samoans are expert sailors. They know exactly how to weave through the gaps in the reef, working with the tides and the currents, 
so they catch big fish. Every Sunday in Savai is Umu Day, when family groups gather together to make an elaborate ceremonial feast. The cooking is done by the men in a separate farle, using the traditional open oven or umu. It starts with a normal fire, but local volcanic rock is piled on top. These rocks absorb and hold so much heat that they'll roast the food long after the fire has died down. One hot rock from the fire is enough to soften the grated coconut, which is squeezed between banana leaf fibers. The result, coconut cream. Warm taro and breadfruit leaves are flexible enough to make a parcel for the cream. Wrapped up and roasted on the fire, it makes a Samoan delicacy called palusami. Once the fire's up to speed, it's leveled out ready for the parcels of fish and coconut. Then the whole oven is sealed over, first with banana leaves which give extra flavor, and then with mats to hold in the heat. The fish should be ready in under an hour. I'm sure like you, like you had died for your McDonald's, it's the same for us in Samoa. There are certain things that we crave for, and thus the taste of the humo is it doesn't match anything that comes out of the electric oven. So that's why our omo is so important. And the omo is also communal. See, we do the omo when we have more families coming together. Like the Sunday, this is when the whole family had to come together, eat together. This is the day that we have to go over with what we had done during the week and to plan our next week. So the omo is really like a, a feast seeing the, the spirit of coming together. What we're building here is a lao, and that's going to function rather like a dragnet to corral some fish. The coconut leaves, yes, coconut leaves again, act this time like a mobile underwater fence. We dragged them out as the tide was falling and made a huge circle. Apparently, it's been known for hundreds of people to turn up for a lawry. Once the circle's complete, everybody starts to walk slowly towards the center, herding the fish inwards as they go. In the middle, Harpoon experts wait to spear as many fish as they can. It's a very effective method of catching fish, so they only do it when they know the stocks are in surplus. distinctly like a carnival. It's been nearly a hundred years since the island was subjected to a natural display of fire. The local volcano, Mount Matavanu, created this moonscape and provided enough volcanic rocks to make good open ovens for centuries.
but man-made fire is still at everyone's fingertips. Like the rest of the skills, it's part of their culture, and the chief in Falialupo makes sure that each child is taught the skills he'll need to live. It's what they've been brought up with from father to son, and then son to the next generation, and so it goes on. But it's something they've always lived with. The chiefly system's very strong in the village. The untitled men listen to the chiefs, and then when they're ordered to do something, they will do it. So it's a culture that will never die in the village, because their kids will be brought up like they were, by their fathers and their forefathers. It's really heartening to see a place where these skills are so valued and secure. The people are very much a part of the modern world, but they are proud of their history and their knowledge. They use their skills daily because they know that on this remote island, with its changing weather, they may need them at any time. When you are in the jungle, you haven't got matches. You should have this knowledge. You will carry your box of matches in your mind and in your muscles. <laughs> These are the skills that will sustain us forever because of our tiny islands. You know, there are possibilities that there may no, not be any plane arriving here in one month. There may be no ship coming here. So we can't depend on things that are being advocated to us, but at least if we have these skills, we can still utilize our environment for us to live and to be able to survive.